Welcome, and thank you for joining us on the conversation directed and produced by the New York State Writers Institute at the University at Albany. My name is Paul Grandal. I'm the director of the Writers Institute. And before I introduce today's guest, Jay Perini, uh, let me remind you that you can find this interview and all of our author interviews archived on our YouTube channel. You can also find them at the conversation at our website, nyswritersinstitute.org. We also would invite you to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and we will have links to the author's books for sale at our local independent bookseller, and you can find that on our website as well. And if you feel like you want to support future programming like this and, and care to make a donation, you can also do that at nyswritersinstitute.org. So let me now introduce our guest, Jay Perini. I say he contains multitudes. He's a poet a novelist, a biographer, a screenwriter, a critic. He's also a distinguished professor of English and creative writing at Middlebury College in Vermont, where he has been a faculty member since 1982. In addition, he's a frequent commentator for national news organizations, including CNN, The Guardian, New York Times, Daily Mail, Salon, Daily Beast, and more. He's also a founding editor of the New England Review, and among his many literary honors, he was awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship in 1993. He's a prolific author who has published, by my count, eight novels, six collections of poetry, 12 books of nonfiction and criticism. That's 26 books, a remarkable output in a variety of genres. He's written acclaimed full-length biographies, John Steinbeck, Robert Frost, William Faulkner, and Gore Vidal. His most recent book, which we'll focus on today, is a memoir titled Borges and Me, An Encounter. It was published in August 2020 by Doubleday. Michael Greenberg, writing in the New York Times book review, said this, it brings Borges more sharply to life than any account I've read or heard, an important contribution to the biography of a major writer, a delicious treat. We're so glad that you're here. Thank you for joining us, Jay. Hey, Paul, thank you for inviting me. It's a treat. We've got so much to talk about. I mean, you, you have been at the heart of, of the literary universe for a long time, but I want to start with Borges and me. I'm just kind of quickly set the scene. It, it's a beautiful, personal, funny, uh, really insightful memoir, both of your life at the time and this, this acclaimed writer. So it's 1970. You've just gone to a doctoral program at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. Your faculty member there is this Alastair Reed. He's a Scottish poet, scholar of South American writers, and also known for his translation of Neruda and Borges in particular. And then Borges is coming to visit, and Reed asks you to drive him around, show him the highlands. Uh, at this part in his life, Borges is almost blind. And it falls upon you after Borges has ingested some of Reed's uh, hash laced brownies to drive him around the countryside. And all kinds of uh, brilliant insight, but also funny. There's a capsizing of a canoe and things. So I'll let you discuss and take it from there. I mean, how did you, how did you one, decide to write 50 years later and publish this book on Borges? You know, I never thought I had a book here. Um, for years, I've been telling the stories. Uh, when I, My very first day with my wife, Devon, whom I've been married to and we're living with for over 40 years, she remembers, uh, I took her out to dinner and I asked her, have you ever heard of Jorge Luis Borges? And she said, um, no. I said, well, he's one of the great writers of our time. And I just, just recently met him. Um, and I told her the story of, and we, I had her in gills of laughter. And I would tell these stories more as jokes at dinner table parties among my friends for decades, you know? My friends, when I first went to teach at Dartmouth in 1975, that's five years after this, are full of memories of my entertaining the crowds <laughs> <laughs> with, with, with my funny stories about traveling with Borges. And to me, it was nothing more than an anecdote and uh, three years ago, I was, four years ago, I was making a movie uh, based on my biography of Gore Vidal. I wrote a script with the director, Michael Hoffman, and we shot a film, we finished it for, for Netflix about Gore uh, in Italy. And I was, Kevin Spacey plays Gore Vidal and it has yet to be released. 
I would want to talk about that. There's a story behind that, but yeah, okay. Well, there's a lot of stories. Um, yeah. but, um, but I was sitting, we were, you know, I was three months in Italy shooting this movie. I was behind the camera for every single take of that movie. And I was sitting in a cafe uh, with, with Ross Clark, who was the English film director, was visiting, and Andy Patterson, the film producer, who was producing the Borges and is an old friend. He produced Girl with Pearl Earring and many films. And Ross took out a copy of uh, Borges' collected poem, uh, collected stories. And I said, oh, do you like Borges? And I said, yeah. He, Ross said, he's the only writer I can read. I read Borges all the time. I always oh. travel with this book, and I have for decades. I said, wow. I said, well, let me tell you, once I traveled with him in the Highlands of Scotland in 1971, he said, oh, come on. I said, no, it's a true story. <laughs> I said, the circumstances were very strange. I was, my, my teacher, my mentor was Alastair Reed, who was translating Borges. And Borges came from Argentina to visit Alastair to work on some new stories in tra to translate them. And uh, Reed had to go away uh, to London and he asked me if I would look after Borges for a little bit. And so I, I said to Borges, what would you like to do? He said, I want you to give me a tour of the Highlands. I want to see the Highlands. But I said, with Borges, you're blind. He said, oh, no, don't tell me you're blind as well. I said, no, I'm not blind. He said, good, Jay, you'll be my eyes. And so we took off in my little dilapidated 1957 Morris Minor, and we drove around the Highlands. And I always just thought, well, it was a series of extremely funny anecdotes. Um, and, you know, like in, we going in, uh, he wanted to go for a new canoe ride and, and he tipped the damn boat over. <laughs> Standing up to, to, to re, wanted to re, he started reciting Beowulf in the, in the bow of the boat and he tipped it over <laughs> as I had to drag him into the shore. And so um, I tell these stories, um, so I'm telling them at dinner parties for, like I said, for years. And, uh, and I told, was telling all these stories to Andy and to Ross Clark and Ross said, that's my next movie. And, um, Young Jay taking Borges around, blind Borges. He was totally blind, by the way, around the Highlands. He could only see yellow, bl oblong shade, sh color shape of yellow. And, um, and I said, well, listen, let me see if I can make some notes uh, that I can put together my recollections, see if it will mount to anything, uh, and then we'll talk. And so when I went home from Italy, I started writing. And in six months, I found I had written over 400 pages of notes. Wow. Remembering, I just tried to remember everything I could about that that grief journey and about my time of life. Then, my ch being avoid trying to, I was being chased by my draft board. I was right. running away from the U.S. in the Vietnam War. I was getting all these letters from my best friend from high school, Billy, from Vietnam. Uh, I was chasing after this beautiful young woman who was head of the Poetry Society, a very up upper class English woman. I was. Um, trying to become a poet myself. I was trying to convince my boss there at St. Andrews, the head of the English department, to let me write this thesis on George Mackay Brown, a living poet that I admired who lived up in Orkney. And, um, and all, everything came together at once. So I essentially wrote this memoir and, and I was amazed. It just came, it just flowed out of me in, in, in like I say, six months. I mean, I, I love your, you're the yeah. perfect foil too, because you really go into your your background. Your your mother is is against it. She's really kind of, of of out of sorts. You know, she's there before you're getting on the the ship to go, and it, it's a really interesting dynamic. But what amazed me about your career is you're this kid from Scranton, Pennsylvania. You're yeah. you're not from a you know a, a literary family or background, and and you get yourself in these places with some of the greatest writers of the 20th century, and we'll talk about Robert Penn Warren and, and others, but is it just luck or do you just have a, I know you're a cook. I think I saw on your website, you like yes. to cook. How, how do you put yourself in position to be around these? I mean, with Borges, it was just a random fluke, right? It was a random fluke, but you know, it had to do with the fact that Alistair was my mentor. Right. And we had a very, you know, intimate literary relationship. He was really, teaching me everything I knew about poetry and fiction. Right. So Alistair was my mentor and friend for life, right? For, until he died a few years ago, we were talked on the phone every week for, yeah. for, 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 for decades. So, you know, the, the trick was I made some very good, close friends early on and then I started writing books. And, um, you know, my first book was published in 1972. Wow. And I was writing for, you know, major papers, the New York Times and London Times, 
and you know major British papers in the early 70s you see when I was in my early 20s right so and then you know um, and then I moved to Dartmouth and I was writing for writing books novels and criticism and poetry in the New Yorker magazine the Atlantic poetry Chicago so you know I was you know I was not exactly unknown even then and so and I and I'm a, I'm a, I'm a pretty good conversationalist, yeah. And I, and I and I like people, you see. Right. And I'm particularly interested in writers. Yeah. And so one thing just led to another, and so I'd wind up uh, in the vicinity of you know someone like Gore Vidal or Robert Penn Warren, and and we became friends. You know, yeah. the thing with Gore Vidal was just an, was another accident. I had a sabbatical year in Italy in the early eighties. And in, in mid '80s, and I um, we went to my, with my wife and two little babies. We went to Amalfi, and we rented this beautiful little cottage, uh, villa it was called on a hillside overlooking the Mediterranean, with a lemon grove behind us. And there was a great castle above us. And I said to the tobacconist, where you'd buy your newspaper, um, oh, who who lives in the castle? Is there a Duke of Amalfi? <laughs> He said, no, no, Gore Vidal lives there, the great American writer. I said, oh my God, does he ever come down here and mix with the hoi polloi? <laughs> and he said, he comes down every day at like clockwork. At four o'clock, he passes your house and he buys a newspaper and he goes into the bar sitting in next door and he drinks a beer and then he takes the bus back up to his house. And I said, well, I, I said, uh, will, will you give him a note? I thought, why not? Try it. I wrote a note, dear, dear Mr. Vidal, I'm an American writer, young writer, professor at Middlebury College in Vermont. Um, I live at 43 Via Torricelli in Amalfi, Trani, which is right between where he lived in Amalfi. And I said, if there's ever a chance of meeting you, it would be a pleasure to just make your acquaintance. That night, <laughs> pounding on the door, Parini! Vidal, come for a drink. Well, I went for a drink. We drank till five in the morning. Uh, he liked his drink, shall we yeah. say. And we became extremely good friends, really close friends. In that year, I was in Amalfi. I had dinner constantly and talked all the time. And practically every day we talked. And, um, and the friendship continued. You know, I went back to the States and frequently went back to Italy. And we sometimes rented the house again in the summers. And I wanted to be near Gore because I enjoyed his company. And, um, and then for years, I would go back in the summer and just stay with him uh, and, his, and his boyfriend, Howard, you know, his partner, Howard. Right. And so, uh, you know, the, and it was terrific. You know, I remember the first week, Gore said, come up to uh, bring your bride. He called my wife my bride. She hated that. <laughs> and he said, and you'll meet Howard. So I went up to the villa, this, the most amazing villa in the universe. Um, $25 million palazzo, really. Wow. And I was quite impressed. And uh, Howard opened the door and I said, ah, I, I said, are you Howard? He said, yes, I'm Howard. He said, I said, what do you do, Howard? He said, do? He said, I'm Gore's secretary. <laughs> I said, well, what does that entail, Howard? He said, entail? Put it this way, big boy, I don't type. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> so, I mean, all this time, you're a writer. Obviously, you use everything that, that comes through your consciousness and subconscious. Are you thinking at that time, I'm, I'm taking notes because these Vidal stories are too beautiful to, to forget or to lose. I mean, you weren't doing that with, with Borges, but were you doing that with Vidal? Were you always thinking, I'm going to write something? I about? think pretty early on, I thought I would write a, write a biography of Gore Vidal one day. Right. So um, I always liked um, Henry James wrote to somebody, a young writer, and said, just try to be someone on whom nothing is lost. Right. And so that's always been my m motto. Be somebody on whom nothing is lost. So you're like a fly on the wall, but you're not sticking a recorder in, in, on the table every time. You're sort of going back to your notebooks maybe after and jotting some things down. Or... I, I've kept notebooks my whole life, and I, write, and I write down bits and pieces. As I did, I just had very few fragments from the Borges trip, you know? But enough to go on. I had one. I had one complete conversation. Our first night out on the road, we stopped in um, Lower Largo, where Robinson Crusoe grew up. His name wow. was Alexander Selkirk. And Borges, I thought he would enjoy seeing 
the home of uh, Selkirk uh, Robinson Crusoe. And we stayed at the Robinson Crusoe Inn. And I remember taking blind Borges down into the dark bar, sawdust floor, and I said, what will you have, Borges? He said, oh, get me typical Scottish beer. I would love one. So I brought him a pint of export. Right. And I remember him sticking his finger in the beer and swirling it around. <laughs> and then he licked it. And I thought, oh, my God, it's going to be a long few days. <laughs> and uh, I said, and I, and I had frankly never heard of Borges. And I said, so uh, I said, uh, Mr. Borges, no, Mr., just Borges. Okay, mi, mi, Borges. I said, Alistair tells me you're a writer. He said, oh, Alistair's always exaggerating. I said, well, you're not a writer? He said, oh, I write these little stories, sometimes only four or five sentences. So I'm very dismissive. I said, how many novels have you written, Borges? No, how many? None. I said, you're 72 years old and you've written no novels and you're a writer of fiction. That's true. I'm very dismissive of him. And I said, well, did you never want to write a novel, Borges? He said, Jay, my dear boy, never want my whole life. I dreamed of writing a novel of the Pampas and there would be gauchos and there would be prostitutes and generations would rise and fall, rise and fall. And there would be fratricide and matricide and patricide, the worst. <laughs> and I said, so what happened, Borges? He said, well, Jay, months passed, years passed, decades passed, and I never wrote the book. But then one morning, after maybe 30 years, I woke up and I went to my desk and I wrote a 200 word review of this novel and that satisfied the impulse. <laughs> that's, that's brilliant. I mean, yeah, yeah the, 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 uh, the, the level of discourse that rolls off his tongue on this kind of road trip is, is brilliant. But let's talk about the doll because that's the double-edged sword of, I mean, every journalist, biographer, writer wants access, but you had maybe too much access because you became a friend yeah. and you actually purposely waited until after he died so you could feel more free to write honestly about him. Talk about that. that you well, know, it was account. difficult because, you know, as in any friendship, it's complicated. And there were periods when we spoke on the phone for years, every single day. Yeah every day. And we often traveled together. We traveled in Britain and London. Up the, and uh, I was just remembering, in fact, things keep coming back to me that I'd never gotten in the book. I was remembering back in the early 90s, Gore and I went to dinner in Sheltonham in England with, with Kurt Vonnegut. Ah. And, uh, and, and we, the three of us sat there and I said to Vonnegut, I said, you know, uh, it's amazing. My students love you. You're, you're just so perennially popular. And he said, yes, he said, I'm a, he said, Jay, I'm a writer who people, um, young men read a passage from my, one of my books on their first date with their future wives. And he said, old men ask for the, uh, me to, something from me, my book to be read at their funerals. <laughs> well, Gore, he's got the lifespan, yeah. And, and Gore said, Kurt, let's hope it's not the same passage. <laughs> he's, I, I read his two memoirs, I mean, <laughs> and I read his historic, I mean, Gore Vidal was a, a brilliant prose stylist and master, but obviously he's telling his story from his viewpoint. You yeah. don't see which comes out in your biography. He could be nasty. He could be a mean drunk, right? I mean. Oh, yeah. I mean, he was terrible at times. You know, I remember one of the last times I was staying with him in Ravello. Uh, it was not that many years ago. Howard was still alive. So it was about 2000, 1999, maybe. Uh, all night, Gord had been drinking heavily scotch, scotch, scotch. I mean, he used to have gone through a whole bottle of scotch by 3 a.m. Wow. And uh he filled his tumbler with another bottle of a glass of scotch and Howard was looking at him like, oh no, it's three in the morning, we're sitting in their living room. Uh, and uh, Gore had been carrying on about how awful Norman Mailer was all night long. Norman Mailer, Norman Mailer, Norman Mailer. Finally he said, Jay, you've been strangely silent tonight. What is your view of Norman Mailer? I said, well, Gore, I said, you know, I largely, as you know, we've been through this a hundred times, I largely agree with you about the main books and the issues with them. But I said, you have to admit that um, The Naked and the Dead is one of the great novels of the Pacific War. 
Howard looked nervously at me, as Gore said. One of the great novels of the Pacific War. Is that what you said? I said, that's what I said. And Gore looked at me, looked into his glass, and he suddenly just hurled the glass at my head. And it, it just grazed the top of my forehead and shattered against the wall. And Howard looked at him and he said, Gore, that was Irish crystal. <laughs> so let's just say there were some high times at the yeah. Villa La Rondinaya. Yeah. It was so when you're writing, what is your meter between total truth and, and trying to just not wallow in, 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 you know, terrible drunken things like that. And well, I had to really walk a very fine line in that book because I waited till his death. Gore wanted me to write it while he was alive. And I right. told him, no, I won't. When you're dead, I'll write it. And he said, you'll write it when I'm dead and you'll portray me as a lecher and a drunk. He said, no, as a homosexual and a drunk. I said, Gore, you are a homosexual and a drunk. <laughs> he said, I knew you'd say that. So um, I, I wanted to draw, I wanted to show Gore's brilliance, the fun of his life, the wild um, uh, cinematic adventure of his life, uh, and also show what a pain in the ass he was, right. and also show that he was a guy, you know, on the prowl, on the make. So it was a very, it's a very interesting literary life. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, and since I happened to be there for 30 some years of it, I had good, good, I had a very ringside seat. So what, what did Howard or any other inner circle, did they read it and comment to you on it or? Oh, many people in Gore's inner circle read the book, even in manuscript and gave me suggestions. Yeah. You know, I was able to interview Howard at great length in the book, for the book. There was no I mean, effort to uh, rein you in about what you would reveal and, and, uh, no, I don't think, no, nobody was reining me in. I think that I just was able to write what I felt like writing. And uh, frankly, to be really, really honest, I sometimes had to rein in my own anger at Gore. Right. Yeah, I'd say that's, that was the hardest part for me, which is why my wife said it was the hardest book I ever had to write, was reining in my own fury at times at Gore. Right. Um, but also my love of him. You know, I learned a great deal about writing from Gore. I'll say that. Remember, I was sitting Brilliant. at his poolside. I was one summer, I was sitting there, and I was, tr I was working on uh, my novel about Walter Benjamin being chased by the Nazis over the Pyrenees in 1940. Um, it's called Benjamin's Crossing. And this novel, working on the movie version of it right now, in fact, it'll become a movie next year. And um, <clears throat> Gore said to me, how's it going, Jay? He sat down next to me. I said, well, I said, Gore, do you think I can have two characters discussing um, the philosophy of Kierkegaard for about 20 or 30 pages in this novel. <laughs> he said, two characters discussing Kierkegaard for maybe 30 pages. I said, yeah. I said, well, Jay, you can do that if you want, but only if these characters are sitting in a railway car and the reader knows there's a bomb under the seat. Good advice. <laughs> oh, that's, that's, that's wonderful. That's the um, best advice I ever had from Vidal. But I also saw recently, uh, you had said in an interview, you're never going to do another biography. I mean, I've done a couple. It's a crushing amount of work. Are you going to hold to that? Is that? Yeah, I will never, ever write another biography. Okay. It, 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 the, the ones I did almost killed me. Uh, you know, John Steinbeck was difficult. Robert Frost, I worked on it for endless years. Yeah. So much research. The Vidal was killing because he was a friend. William Faulkner was a, a bear to write. And enough is enough. I've done, I've done five or six of them. But let's but, talk to Steinbeck. That came about because his widow. Did, tell us the genesis of well, that. Well, that was my first biography. I never intended to write a biography, but then I got a call from his widow. And she'd read one of my novels and she said, um, and she, we had a mutual friend. Uh, Tony Harvey, his name was, and he said, she said, oh, Tony gave me your number, and, I, and I, we both think you'd be great to write the biography of, uh, of John. We need a new, we want a new biography of John. There already was an older one that she hated, and so uh, she said, I'll, 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 and I said, I don't know if I can. I've never written a biography. She said, look, I'll, I'll sit with you. I'll open up my diary. You'll, all of John's contacts will be your contacts. I'll introduce you to everybody. You know, you'll meet all the people that John knew, 
and uh, you know Edward Albee and so forth and uh, you, you know and endless people who were still alive and who were quite remarkable that John Steinbeck knew so it was irresistible so I took it on it was a hell of a deal and in fact I little did I realize that she quite literally would sit over my shoulder that's what I, I know you've talked about the double-edged sword I mean sometimes access and cooperation like that can just be the wrong, the yeah. wrong thing, right? And I had fabulous access. I could quote anything I wanted. Uh, and on the other hand, Mrs. Steinbeck wanted to read everything I wrote and kibitz and comment and say, oh, no, no, don't talk about that. Yeah. So that it was just, I found it was, ex I found it in the end uh, kind of exhausting and I was relieved to get through that book alive. Right, <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> It, it seems like even on your website, out of all the genres you've published and gotten known in, poet is first. It seems like poetry is the shelter in the storm from all this swirling about, all, all this drama with these other projects. Why is it poetry at, at your heart and soul? And is it your most important uh, yeah. genre? I, I mean, my first interest was poetry. Um, you know, in graduate school, I wrote my PhD thesis on the poet Theodore Retke. Uh, I've, I've always been mainly a reader of poetry and a writer of poetry. Every day I focus on my poetry if I can. And then, you know, prose comes a bit later in the day. And um, so I've always, you know, written poetry my whole life. You know, my, the, there's, there's my collected poems came out a couple of years ago, right. uh, which was collected poems 1975 to 2015. That's 40 years of poetry or more. And um, so it's, uh, you know, it's been my first love. And I, I, poetry is my, it's, it's the inner voice. It's the still small voice. It's the voice I hear when I lie down and close my eyes at night in bed. It's the voice of, of, of the real self talking back to the universe. Um, it's it's, it's um, you know, me trying to find my sanity in the world through this language. And that's, so, so to me, that's, the, that's crucial. It's part of my, it's almost now become part of my meditative practice, right? Right. I right. begin every day with my meditations and and, and, you, and poetry. And that's my, that, and then, then, then it's other projects, the world, you know, the novels now and the screenplays. And teaching. I mean, we'll, yeah. we'll get to that too. There's so much to talk about. But I, I interviewed Cynthia Ozick uh, once she came to the Writers Institute and she gave me her hierarchy of literature. At the very bottom, which hurt me, was journalism, which I still do, and, 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 and just slightly upward, nonfiction writers, biographers, and things. Then the next ladder was for short story writers, or uh, novelists, actually, novelists, then essayists, short story writers, and at the very top, poets, because mm -hmm. the distillation, the compaction, the, the uh, you know, the, 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 the the, the tense, the, the toughness of it, it's, it's just all boiled down. She yeah. said they are the greatest in, in the literary universe. Do you agree with that? Oh, 100%. You know, I, I really live in my heart with T.S. Eliot and Frost. I live with Seamus Heaney. I live with, uh, you know, you know um, John Keats and John Milton. I live with Emily Dickinson and Marianne Moore and... Um, Elizabeth Bishop, you know, these are the voices that are in, in my head, and in my heart, right. and I keep returning to again and again. Alistair Reed, Neruda, Pablo Neruda. Yeah. Uh, I love Neruda. I met Neruda through Alistair as well. And, and what these other uh, Robert Penn Warren, these, these great literary figures, and I want to hear your, your J.D. Salinger story, but what did you take from, obviously, from Gore Vidal, and even Borges, and, and they're also regular people too, right? They're funny, they tip over yeah. canoes, they have insecurities, they have- a, Well, they have, they have massive insecurities and they've all got their problems. They're all just trying to get from one day to the next and one right. po poem to the next or one novel to the next or one journalism article to the next, right? Yeah. And, and in the course of this, of a literary type of a life where just uh, that I've led, you know, you meet, you meet practically, you meet a lot of people, right? Yeah. I mean, I've met a lot of people, you know. I'm currently actually writing a novel about Graham Greene. Wow. And I, and, and I met Graham Greene when I was that same time I met Gore Vidal. He was living out on Capri and uh, through a friend called Shirley Hazard. And, um, and I went and he invited me up to uh, his, his own house up in um, 
Antibes in the south of France. And I went there and stayed with him for a week once and had the most amazing conversations with Graham Greene. One night he told me some astonishing stories, which I wrote in my notebook, and I'm, I'm about his time during the World War II when he was working in see, undercover for MI6. And really he said the heart of all of his fiction was his time there in Sierra Leone. Mm. And so I'm, I'm halfway through a novel about Graham Greene. And again, it's Graham, I'm writing a novel here about a guy that I knew personally, Graham Greene. Right. So this is what I want to talk about, too, because I've seen you um, interviewed about Borges and, and me, and you talk about, you know, this is 50 years later. You, you have taken notes, but you recreate some dialogue, and you, you call it, you have a certain term. I mean, memory is very faulty 10 minutes later, let alone 50 years. So, so how do you get around that? that, well, with, that the Borges, is... with Borges and me, I call it either autofiction or um, I call it in the, in the book, I say this is a novelized memoir. Yeah. And I say, look, I, and I say right up front in the back there, look, I wasn't carrying a tape recorder. I have a few scratchy notes. The one complete conversation is the one I repeated to you earlier. Right. For the most part, I had odd remarks the Borges made to me that I found amusing or interesting. Like I asked him, he told me the greatest book was uh, A Thousand and One Nights. And I said, who wrote that? And he said, I did. I wrote all the classics and it's annoyed my contemporaries. <laughs> So I wrote that down. That's good. <laughs> I, but I like your transparency and, and yeah. your honesty. And the book is very honest. The whole beginning where you kind of set up your, your life and your mother and things are very honest. But people like Glenn Fry and other, other memoirists have gotten into trouble by, by, you know, advertising it as pure truth, only the truth. And, and I've always felt like memoir was, was sort of a squishy yeah. genre. Well, I, I mean, I, ha I knew how, what trouble people get into. And so I, and I knew I'd be novelizing this. In fact, I, when I first wrote it, I called it, an, oops, I called it a novel. Yeah. And then, and then I changed my mind to call it an encounter. Yeah. And, now, and, and so I call it, now I call it auto fiction or um, a novelized memoir. But I'm very upfront about the fact in the back that, you know, I wasn't carrying a tape recorder, uh, right. and I'm just um, trying to remember uh, things, conversations, and exactly where we went, even, right. and you know the time scales. I'm, I mean, who knows, right? So I'm just so it's, I'm, I'm sort of basing it on something that happened to me, but kind of inventing it as I go along. Right. And uh, uh, also, I decided to, to make it as a kind of as I had the impression that Borges, when when he thought it was pretty amusing that I'd never heard of him. Right. <laughs> and. Uh, and, and, and then I realized in retrospect, when I went to read Borges, literally weeks after I got, a week after I got back, I, I went to the bookstore and bought Labyrinths and I read the stories and I said, holy God, he was, he was introducing me to his fiction as we went along. Right. And, right. and essentially we lived through many of his short stories. And yeah. so I made that the central conceit of the book. You know, so we stopped at a library and I, and I, and I played with the story, The Library of Babel. Mm. Um, you know, there was the time Borges at one point slipped on the road and banged his head. I had to take him to an, a, a first aid clinic. And, um, and, and he said to me, oh, I have a story. You must read it one day um, about a man who falls and bangs his head. And far from forgetting everything, he could remember everything. <laughs> and he said, that is a nightmare. So, I put, so, I, so essentially, he was introducing me to his um, fiction. Yeah. as we traveled along. And so I was able to use this book as a way of introducing Borges. And also Borges was a self-quoter. Borges is everybody who ever met Borges knew. He was in, he said the same thing over and over and over to everybody. Yeah. And he had certain lines he did. Pretty much everything he says in my book can be found online somewhere in an interview. Right. Because you know? he said the same thing, the same Which, few things to everybody over and over and over again. Which is kind of common when people start referring themselves in the third person, when they come a, a bigger than, larger than life figure, you know, they start yeah. quoting themselves. That's it, and especially him being blind. Right. And he lived in this, this universe of his, of his fictions. Yeah. And so, and he had his writers that he loved, you know, Beowulf and Robert Louis Stevenson and so forth, and he quoted them endlessly. Shakespeare, yeah. uh, you know, Cervantes, you know. Yeah. So, you know, he, you know, it was, it was hilarious, really. He called so me Sancho, as in Sancho Panza. I do remember, one of the things I remember is when, before we took off on our journey, he took his cane, you know, we carried a stick, right? He smacked the hood of my car and he said, you know, I, I, I name you Rochinante, the lazy horse of Don Quixote. 
And he said, you, Jay, he called me Giuseppe, you, Giuseppe, will be Sancho Panza. <laughs> I mean, you had great material. He was such a colorful, I mean, it, it could have been a dud just sitting there in silence and doing, you know, I mean, you had a colorful, so, so are you going to have enough to do a uh, J.D. Salinger book? Give me that encounter. And oh, no, you know, I don't have, I have so little. Again, it's through Alistair. Alistair worked at the, at the New Yorker for years, and he was a friend of J.D. Salinger's. In fact, he was, uh, Salinger gave him Catcher in the Rye to, to edit, and Alistair went over my hand, the manuscript and made suggestions and discussed it with Salinger. And so um, Alistair would frequently come to visit me when I was a young professor at Dartmouth. He came up all the time. And whenever he did, he would call Jerry Salinger, sure. and they would meet up and have lunch. And uh, one, one time, Salinger simply came over to my apartment in, uh, in, in Hanover, uh, and he turned up at my door. Alistair was out shopping for food. And so Jerry came, and I welcomed him in. He sat down, spoke to him for a few minutes. But Alistair made it clear to me that he wanted to be alone when Salinger was there. And Salinger didn't like people to be yeah. around. So, so I met him. Um, but then um, I had, a, 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 for years, I, when I taught Dartmouth um, from 19, what, 75 to 81 and, or so, and um, 82 or something like that. And um, 81, I forget. But in any case, uh, my office was in Sanborn House, which had a hallway leading into the basement of the, of the Dartmouth College Library, mm. where you've got the Orozco murals on the wall there. And, uh, and frequently at night, I would often be in my office, you know, working till 9, 10, 11 o'clock at night in my office. Um, and, uh, and, and Salinger would come in to use the library. He, he liked to write in the Orozco room there. Wow. And so he would come by and he, I always see him with his, you can see him with his like slick raincoat and his leather gloves. And my door would be often open and he would tip his head in the door and nod and I'd say, Jerry, and he'd go in and he'd um, sit at the table in there. Once I remember walking in and I could see two students, two, two young women, and they were writing papers on Catcher in the Rye. And they were sitting on either side of Salinger with their books open, talking over him to each other. And he was sitting there with his own yellow pad and they had no idea that it was the old man between them. Beautiful. Challenger. Now that's, that's something, you, that's not something you got a poem or something there. That's something you got to write at some point. That, that was to me, uh, uh, that, that division of Salinger sitting between these two young students who were, were talking about Salinger to me was unbelievable. But it, again, I wouldn't, I, I, I'm not claiming to have known Salinger. No. But, I'm, but I mean, we've met even Salinger. from what you saw, the eccentricities are, are pronounced, I guess. Huh? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I think um, so. He seemed very eccentric and, and very reclusive and difficult. And, you know, um, you know, I, I didn't, I knew enough. Alistair who told me, he said, don't try to get into a conversation with him. If he passes your office again, your door, just wave and nod. And that was, that was all he wanted to do. Yeah. I've, I've got to ask you, I've never seen this and I don't think uh, I've, I've, I've I know. Um, St. Andrews, the birthplace of golf, on my bucket list. I'm a golfer. Did you golf when you were there? Yeah, you couldn't not golf. I lived yeah. there for seven years. Right. It's the birthplace of golf. I even had drinks at the Royal and Ancient Golf Club. Oh, yes. Oh. <laughs> but did you still play? Did you get to be pretty good? or? Did... You know, I could play golf reasonably well. Um, I don't anymore, but I did. Yeah. And, um, and but, um, what I'd say, I, I tell the story in the, in the Borges book of, uh, of when Alistair served us, um, the first, one of the first night school workers was there, we ate all these hash brownies. Right. Right, and they were really strong. And Borges got wildly excited and went running out of, the, out of doors blind. He wanted to run to the North Sea. So <laughs> we followed him out and, and, and we found him, across, we, Alistair lived right on the old course. Oh, really? Right on yeah. the old course, his cottage. And there was, you know, sand traps. And then there was the, you know, the fairway. That was the 17th fairway. And then the beach. And never forget, um, Alistair and I were chasing after Borges and saying, stop, Borges, stop. And, um, and, and, we, and he, he did stop. And he started, he said, I've always wanted to recite the Anglo-Saxon poem, Seafarer, to the North Sea. But he was actually on the 17th green at St. Andrews. <laughs> and he was facing away from the sea looking at a putting green, reciting the seafarer. And they also said, don't, in, don't tell him, don't interrupt him. This, that's a two stroke penalty at least. That's hilarious, yeah. I mean, <laughs> the stories, you, you had a wonderful subject. Borges is, is uh, 
great, great figure. Um, but I love how you, it, it's really a, a dual memoir. It's about you as a young person, uncertain of yourself and, and honest about your own insecurities and do I belong here? And, and you really learn from the master a lot of life lessons. Uh, yeah, that's right. Beautifully. It's about life lessons and yeah. uh, but it's about my own coming of age. Yeah. As a human being, as much as a writer. Right. I want you to read a, a poem that I think speaks to this moment and also yeah. a, an excerpt from Borges and me, if, mm. if, if you can. But talk yeah. about... Yeah, talk about what? How much time have we got? We, we, got, we got time. I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not rushed if you're not, but mm. um, what did you feel when you saw that mob, uh, you know, attacking the Capitol on Wednesday? What, what were I your initial... Been, my first thought, this, was the, this is the actual obvious consequence of the of the behavior of this ghastly man i mean it was only in october he 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 tweeted to the to the white supremacists in michigan liberate uh the governor's mansion right right he basically and they and there was and they made a plot to kidnap the governor of michigan right so i mean right then i would have had trump arrested for inciting violent behavior right. trump should have long ago simply been arrested uh, Trump is now uh, culpable of sedition, and which carries a 20-year sentence. He should be in jail yesterday, not right. tomorrow. Right. Trump should just be arrested and put in jail. That's right. where he belongs. Right. He is a he is a criminal mind, uh, and and he's been you know, and he's had this group of, gr of fellow grifters in the White House now for four years, and he's had this you know pusillanimous party party called the Republicans. Uh, you know, licking his boots, and it is an appalling historical spectacle, and it has to stop. It's appalling. So, 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 I, was just, so I was, I was, of course, like everybody in the country, horrified. But you know, and we, and of course, he's held, he built up this white supremacist mob. It's also a natural consequence of of the of, of American history of racism, which is very profound, right. and difficult, and thorny. It's, I mean, I mean, back in 1901. Uh, in the book, uh, the, the 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 souls of black folk, um, we read the, the 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 line, the crucial line in America is the color line. W. E. B. Du Bois. Right. The crucial line in America is always the color line, and 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 it's about that. And you know, from post Reconstruction era to the present, there's a lot of fury and and confusion, and uh, you know, difficulty and the races in this country. It's part of our history. And now, you've Trump been, you've created on that. He fuels it. Yeah. I mean, I know you've been an activist uh, um, on the liberal progressive left side for your life or from your adult life, and yet you were almost canceled. They, they were calling you a conservative, if I remember. It got flipped yes. on you, right? It got flipped on me when we had um, uh, a right-wing speaker come to Middlebury College, and there was a bit of a stampede of students trying to shut him down. And so I came out and I, I said, well, look, I do believe in free speech. There are limits to free speech, but there are, to, but I think we should have let the guy have a say and then we should have argued with him. And, and, and I almost myself, uh, I had a student come by my office to interview me and say, um, oh, I'm from the student newspaper and I wonder if I could argue. And I, I said, sure, come on in. And he said, well, I understand you're some sort of a conservative. I said, that's how you see me? <laughs> he said, yeah. So, well, you know, I was very heavily involved in the protest against the Vietnam War. Uh, when Martin Luther King was assassinated, I went down to Tennessee on a march. Right on the right at that moment, I said, "You know, I was con I, I was one of the founders in, during the Iraq War of the group Poets Against the War." Mm. Uh, you know, I I spoke up. I wrote many op-ed pieces. I said, "You know, when uh, when gay marriage came up before the Supreme Court, I wrote the main opinion piece for CNN about why we should have gay marriage." Uh, I said, "I'm so I'm not sure." how I count as a conservative. <laughs> a teachable especially, moment. You especially know. a well-known conservative. Right. I like that, you know. Certainly I believe in free speech, um, but, um, you know. Hopefully the kid learned something and went back and did a little more research. And yeah. uh, Well, I said to him, so what do you want to be when you leave Middlebury? He said, journalist. I said, okay, the first thing you do when you interview somebody is do a little bit of research. Right. You could, you could have simply Googled my name Right. And Wikipedia would come up, and you would see, you know, that it's all there in black right. and white. What I've what I've been doing. My right. Whole life. 
So you've got your collected poems there, I see. Um, yeah. Do you Let agree that I was last night reading some of your poems, and I thought after the terror, even though it was written after 9-11. Um, well, relevant. Yeah, relevant to today, yeah. It's, it's a villanelle. The villanelle is a very intricate form. Emily Dickinson one wrote, once wrote, after great pain, a formal feeling comes. And the most formal feeling you can get as a poet is to write a villanelle with its tightly rhymed and repeating refrain lines, mm. okay? Yes. After the terror, everything has changed, though nothing has. They've changed the locks on almost every door and windows have been bolted just in case. It's business as usual, someone says. Is anybody left to mind the store? Everything has changed, though nothing has. The same old buildings huddle in the haze with faces at the windows floor by floor, the windows they have bolted just in case. No cause for panic, they maintain, because the streets go places they have been before. Everything has changed, though nothing has. We're still a country that is ruled by laws. The system's working, and it's quite a bore that windows have been bolted just in case. Believe in victory and all that jazz. Believe we're better off, but less is more. Everything has changed, though nothing has. The windows have been bolted, just in case. Wow, thank that, you. It's, it does fit the present moment rather, exactly. ir rather eerily. Yes, that's after the terror in, in your uh, collected poems. Thank you, Jay. Um, You're very welcome, Paul. Do, we, do you have a, a short excerpt from Borges and Me that gives us a little flavor of the... Well, let's just see if I can maybe just read the very ending. Yeah. Um, Were you surprised? I mean, this, this got rave reviews and... and um, yeah, I mean, I couldn't believe it. I mean, a yeah. huge full page in the Times and, uh, and um, Wall Street Journal and Starred Review, Publishers Weekly, Kirkus Reviews, you know, you name it. And, um, and I've been getting, I swear to God, I get five to 10 emails from strangers every day of my life wow. about this book. Yeah. And, and, and you spent, what, 20, year, 20 years on Frost and six months on Borges and the return yeah. on investment? There's, there's no fairness in life, is there? <laughs> I spent 25 years writing my biography of Robert Frost. 25, wow. Yeah, but you know, I was working doing other stuff as well. I guess you took the road less traveled, we could say. <laughs> And this book, I just, you know, wrote in a fell swoop in, but, you know, I hit the note, you know? Yeah. It's a question often of just getting the tone. Here's how it ends. And Bella is the girlfriend that he's, that he's yearning for. Right. And he sees her there um, and says, Bella drifted there. They're done. Finally, it ended with, you know, Borges recommended that we have a, we conclude his time in St. Andrews with a bonfire on the beach. And we gathered all this driftwood. And Borges insisted, I get my letters from my draft board, and we burn them one by one in the fire. And then Borges and Alistair and Jasper and I and our friend Jeff gathered, linked arm in arm, and Borges started singing this Argentinian song, and we did a little dance around the fire. And I looked and I saw Bella, the girl, with her shoes off, standing in the waves. And, and, I, and I, so I write, Bella drifted by herself toward the sea, where she slipped off her red sneakers and socks, and stepped barefoot into the surf. She raised her shift so that her long legs glistened in unsurprising beauty. The sea washed around her knees, a foamy mix. The wind picked up slightly and her dress opened, almost disappeared. The music was like thunder everywhere on the beach as the surf rose and crashed. I took my sh own shoes off and walked toward her. The light was palpable, soft, succulent. I could taste the pink orange of the clouds as the sun pulsed and shone in the water. The sea itself was a sprawl of diamonds. Bella smiled at me, an invitation, and I walked toward her on the quivering water. That's poetry, Jay Perini. That's poetry. <laughs> I mean, that's why it helps to be a poet. That, that's beautifully written. Um, very sensual, too. Um, this has been a great delight. I hope that we can 
sometime when we get the vaccine and things are clear, have you on campus, um, you know, Lovely. have a nice dinner with, uh, with uh, Bill Kennedy and some writer friends and, and uh, hear some more of these wonderful stories. But poet, novelist, screenwriter, critic, Professor Jay Perini, thank you very much, Jay. Thank you, Paul. Lovely to talk. Thanks a lot. Again, bye-bye. Bye-bye.